If we look back on what consciousness previously took and now takes responsibility for, on what it previously ascribed and now ascribes to the thing, we see that consciousness alternately makes itself, as well as the thing, into both a pure, manyless one and into an also that resolves itself into independent matters. Consciousness thus finds through this comparison that not only its truthful perceiving contains the distinct moments of apprehension and withdrawal into itself, but rather that the truth itself, the thing, reveals itself in this twofold way. Our experience then is this, that the thing exhibits itself for the consciousness apprehending it in a specific manner, but is at the same time reflected out of the way in which it presents itself to consciousness and back into itself. In other words, it contains in its own self an opposite truth to that which it has for the apprehending consciousness. Having spent a considerable amount of time and ink in developing this dialectic that's occurring between consciousness and the object of consciousness occurring in perception, or varnemung, the literally taking the truth of the, the object for consciousness, we're now at about the midpoint, and what we're going to see happening in the next several uh, paragraphs is that there's going to be a doubling that's been there implicit the entire time, but now being made explicit by the phenomenological analysis. So Hegel is going to say that there's something going on in consciousness, and remember, consciousness is taking in both consciousness and the thing, and as we're going to see, other things, and, and you know even what's beyond consciousness. But consciousness has been approaching the thing in perception as if the thing has its particular composition or characteristics or qualities and truth lies entirely on the side of the thing, very much as, as with sense certainty. And it's finding out that no truth ends up being, you might say, diffused in, into the relationship between these. And what we're going to see happen is that consciousness, which is up until this point been saying, well, if there's any if there's anything in here that doesn't coincide with this, that's falsity and that lies on the side of consciousness. It's going to find something similar occurring even in the object itself and thereby, you might say, validating itself as what's been previously been made responsible or even guilty for the illusions or misperceptions that are going on. So Hegel is going to say that um, if we look back on what consciousness previously took responsibility for, we see consciousness alternately, alternately makes itself as well as the thing. It's, it's, it's realizing that there's a similarity of structure there. Into both a pure, manyless one, something that's lacking multiplicity precisely because it has unity. You might say that's the cost of having unity in a, a sense where the unity is meaningful, where the unity asserts itself. Um, the unity makes the, the portions, the parts, the components into things that don't really matter as much because the focus is on the one. By the way, I put the also, which is in your text, in, in uh, capital letters, uh, choice on, on Miller, the translator's part, into a lowercase to stress that with the also, with the multiplicity, with the, the medium, as we've seen, for stressing this aspect of it, um, the thing becomes just a bearer of, of qualities or predicates or however you want to talk about it. And those exist in concrete, determinate relations to each other, pushing off each other, as I've said before, uh, relating, e relating to each other by way of opposition, being what they are precisely by not being the other, and that's made possible for those properties because the thing in that respect doesn't assert itself as a unity, but just something that kind of, you know, glues them together, the medium in which they can occur. And we've got a doubling of aspect here. Um, both of these are indeed what it is that the one uh, and consciousness are. So... If you're going to ask yourself, well, what is the thing? There's no simple answer to it at this point. 
And that's actually a great realization, because up until now, Hegel has had consciousness trying out this simple answer and this simple answer, and it always turns out that every simple answer is more complicated than we thought, uh, but that shouldn't be a surprise at this point in, in going through Hegel, should it? So he says, um, consciousness thus finds through this comparison that not only its truthful perceiving, where it is perceiving the thing and sort of taking in the thing, you might say, into itself, contains the distinct moments of apprehension and withdrawal into itself, uh, you know, these, these two sides, but rather that the truth itself, the thing, reveals itself in this twofold way. So there's a similarity of, of you might say, structure of relationship going on between consciousness, consciousness of the thing, and what's actually there in the thing itself. This is a very important realization. So he says, our experience, then, is this. The thing exhibits itself for the consciousness apprehending it in a specific manner, but is at the same time reflected out of the way in which it presents itself to consciousness and back into itself. That is this, this movement of you know, unity, the reflection back into itself. That's what gives it this oneness, this, you might even say, substantiality. And the same thing, by the way, is going on for consciousness. Consciousness asserts itself as having presence, as really being there. This is what gives these things the capacity to be able to reflect upon themselves. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that the thing is conscious. Hegel's not going quite so far. But there is some dynamic relation to self that is going on that is not encompassed by consciousness, but can be noted by consciousness within the very being of the thing. That's something worth mulling over. So it's not just the unity of the thing that's being reflected into itself. It's also the contrast between the unity and the multiplicity that is being reflected into itself, but that becomes the less important side, at least at this point. He says, um, in other words, it contains in its own self an opposite truth to that which it has for the apprehending consciousness. The thing is now, you might say, asserting itself against what the perceiving consciousness wants to take in. And again, consciousness is able to note this, but it's not able to entirely assimilate it. <clears throat> These sort of things over here, you might say, they can indeed be assimilated. You know, we think again about the, the organs, the multiplicity within consciousness of the, you know, the taste, the smell, the, 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 the feeling, the sight and all that. That can be taken in. This can only be grasped in a somewhat different way or approached in a different way. As I said, noted. It can be realized, it can be experienced, but not completely brought with into the purview of consciousness, as we're going to see in the following paragraphs. Thus, consciousness has got beyond this second type of attitude and perceiving, too, that is the one in which it takes the thing as truly self-identical, and itself for what is not self-identical, but returns back into itself out of identity. The object is now for consciousness this whole movement which was previously shared between the object and consciousness. The thing is a one reflected into itself. It is for itself, but it is also for an other. And moreover, it is an other on its own account just because it is for an other. Accordingly, the thing is for itself and also for an other, a being that is doubly differentiated but also a one. But the oneness contradicts this diversity. Hence, consciousness would again have to assume responsibility for placing the diversity in the one and for keeping it away from the thing. It would have to say that insofar as it is for itself, the thing is not for an other. But the oneness also belongs to the thing itself as consciousness is found by experience. The thing is essentially reflected into itself. The also, or the indifferent difference, thus falls as much within the thing as does the oneness. But since the two are different, they do not fall within the same thing, but in different things. The contradiction which is present in the objective essence as a whole is distributed between two objects. In and for itself, the thing is self-identical, but this unity with itself is disturbed by other things. 
Thus, the unity of the thing is preserved, and at the same time, the otherness is preserved outside the thing, as well as outside of consciousness. In section 123, consciousness is still part of the picture. It's still engaging in perception, and it's still observing what's going on in perception. But most of the development that's going to take place in this paragraph is going to happen on the side of the thing. So consciousness is looking on and seeing what's going on in its perception. And there's a number of different things happening here that can get mixed up. So we want to try to disentangle them. We, want to say, we don't want to say they're totally separate from each other because Hegel doesn't think that they're actually separate. But they are distinguishable. So he says, we've gotten beyond the second kind of attitude in perceiving, the one which took the thing as, as truly self-identical. Now we realize that the thing itself is not self-identical, and it's so not self-identical that it's turned into a duplicity, uh, a duplicity of the one and the also, or differentiated multiplicity. Now, it's, it's also reflected into itself. It has this relationship of being for itself that... In many respects, we might think only goes for conscious things, but Hegel says that things that are being perceived are also for themselves in this way, metaphysically. So he goes on and he says, um, it returns to itself, back into itself, out of identity. The object is now for consciousness this whole movement, which was previously shared between object and consciousness. So the thing is, in our perception all these dialectical developments that have been taking place up until this point. The, the perceiving of it is at least implicitly perceiving that this is, in fact, what is wrapped up in perceiving a, a thing. So he says the thing is a one. It's reflected into itself. It's for itself, right? It has a relation to itself as being a one. That's part of what the reflection is. But it's also for another, and we want to ask, well, what is this other? And we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. So he says, it's for another. Moreover, it is an other on its own account. So this thing itself is also an other to whatever this other is here. So it's an other to this other. Um, that means that it doesn't have its being totally in, an, in itself. You might say that, that for Hegel, no object is simply what it is in an inert way, you know, completely opaque or passive, uh, where consciousness just has to encounter it. There's already a dynamism going on both within the object and in its relation to this other. Now we want to figure out, well, what is that, that other? So let's look at what he says. Thing is a one reflected to itself as for itself before another. Um, the thing is for itself and also for another, a being that is doubly differentiated, but also a one. Now, what is that? Well, that could be consciousness over here, right? So maybe the for another is being for consciousness. But what we're actually going to see going on in this entire development is that the other is really... An other thing, a being that, like the thing, has unity in it, but also differentiated multiplicity. So the thing is an other for another thing. And this is a, a relationship that is reciprocal. The, the other thing takes the thing as being its other. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. We can also say this other thing is also related to itself. It also has the relationship of for itself, just like the thing does. Now, that's going to assume more importance as we move into the next paragraph. Here, Hegel is not going to develop that quite so much. He's going to focus on what's going on within the thing itself. So he says, um, consciousness, um, 
Oh, here we go. Accordingly, the thing is for itself and also for another, a being that is doubly, doubly differentiated, but also a one. But the oneness contradicts this diversity. There's still this tension going on here. And we also have a tension going on between these. Because the oneness in this and the oneness in this are the same kind of oneness. So if this is what makes the thing what it is, what gives it its substantiality, well, that's also over here in this one. So maybe it's not entirely belonging to this one. And the one over here can say the same thing, because from its point of view, so far as we can talk about having a point of view, this is the alien, this is the other, this is the one that is a reflection of itself. So we go on. He says, this oneness contradicts this diversity. Hence, consciousness would again have to assume responsibility for placing the diversity in the one and keeping it away from the thing. It would have to say that insofar as it is for itself, the thing is not for another. But the oneness belongs to the thing as consciousness has found from experience. So consciousness is not going to fall in the trap of saying, oh, I must have screwed up over here, the mistake is in me, um, you know, the, these things that I'm perceiving now, because remember, perception is also of this thing. They're simple, they exist in themselves, there's no, you know, complex dynamism going on here, there's no internal contradiction to these things. Consciousness can't say that anymore, because consciousness realizes that this is the truth of the thing. This is the truth of perception, that what we're perceiving is something that is doubled in its very essence, in its very reality. As a matter of fact, everything that we're perceiving that's a thing has that characteristic. So he says, um, what does consciousness realize? It, ha it, 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 um, it would have to say, insofar it is for itself, it's not an other, but the oneness belongs to the thing itself as consciousness is found by experience. The thing is essentially reflected into itself. To be a one, consciousness has realized, means that you can't be entirely a one, that you have to have this dynamic tension between the two of these, and there has to be this relationship of being, being related to itself in otherness. Other, also to an other in otherness, right? So he goes on and he says, um, it would have to say that insofar as it is for itself, the thing is not for another. But we know that that's not the case. So, the also or the indifferent difference, the difference that doesn't make a difference, the literally, go either way, glygultiga, untershid, thus falls as much within the thing as does the oneness. But since the two are different, they don't fall within the same thing, but in different things. This is sort of cast out the indifferent difference. It's cast out of the thing and becomes its own thing. So the thing already contains a multiplicity of thingness within itself because it seems like it wants to be this, but it's also this at the same time. It can't hold itself together ontologically, and yet it still does to some degree. So he says, the contradiction which is present in the objective essence as a whole is distributed between two objects. What are these two objects? This and this, the unity and the multiplicity. But it's also being distributed between the thing and another whole thing, of which we can say the same thing that we have an also here. So we have, in many respects, not just a dyadic relation, but a quadratic relation, where the same, th the same process, I almost said the same thing, the same process is occurring within the thing as is occurring in the other thing, this bifurcation, this splitting, this tension, this contradiction within them. So he says, in and for itself, the thing is self-identical. But that doesn't get us anywhere, so the in and for itself is not really what the thing is. This unity within itself is disturbed by what? Other things, other presences, other dynamic sets of relations within themselves. The unity of the thing is preserved, and at the same time the otherness is preserved outside of the thing, as well as outside of consciousness. Now that gets really interesting. That's something to reflect on. 
Consciousness has been observing this the whole time, right? So there's something that's outside of both the thing or the other thing and outside of consciousness. Now, it's not going to remain outside of consciousness because this is an idealism, right? We want to bring it back into consciousness, but it presents a challenge that paragraphs, you know, 124 and on are going to have to respond to. So you notice we've got a very messy chalkboard here. Why do we have such a messy chalkboard? Because there's so much going on within a single thing. A single thing, like a piece of chalk, turns out to be so much more complex than we ever thought to begin with. Now, although it is true that the contradiction in the objective essence is in this way distributed among different things, yet the difference will, for that reason, attach to the singular separated thing itself. The different things are thus established as existing on their own account, and the conflict between them is so far reciprocal that each is different, not from itself, but only from the other. But each is thereby determined as being itself a different thing, and has its essential difference in its own self, all the while not as if this difference were an opposition in the thing itself. On the contrary, for itself, it is, simple, it is a simple determinateness which constitutes the thing's essential character and differentiates it from others. As a matter of fact, since differentness is present in it, it is, of course, necessarily present as an actual difference manifoldly constituted. But, because the de determinateness constitutes the essence of the thing by which it distinguishes itself from other things and is for itself, this further manifold constitution is the unessential aspect. Consequently, the thing does indeed have the twofold insofar within its unity, but the aspects are unequal in value. As a result, this state of opposition does not develop into an actual opposition in the thing itself, but insofar as the thing, through its absolute difference, comes into a state of opposition, it is opposed to another thing outside of it. Of course, the further manifoldness is necessarily present in the thing too, so that it cannot be left out, but it is the unessential aspect of the thing. Now in section 124, we're going to see a little bit of a progression, or you might say a leaving behind occur. And we've got the thing over here, it's rather complex, but we're actually going to say some of this is less important. Some of it is unessential, in Weisenlich, in, in Hegel's terminology. And if we wanted to bring in terms that he's not using in this paragraph, which are very helpful, we can say that in thinking about the one and the also, the also becomes less important at this point. We've spent a lot of time sketching out the, the necessity for the thing to be both a one, a unity, and also, and as well, and also a manifold of differences preserved together in um, a kind of, you know, neutral medium in which the differences themselves can push against each other, can oppose to each other, the, that's what the qualities or properties can do. And we're going we're gonna to de-emphasize that now in this part, because we've seen that the thing exists by way of opposition to other things. So we have uh, at the first thing, at the first part of the paragraph, it's hard to avoid all this also in thing language, isn't it? Uh, we ought to really be careful when we're doing this. So we have a thing, and it exists in difference to a thing. And notice I've got other in parentheses here, because either one of these could be seen as the other. For this thing, this thing is the thing, but it's also an other to the other thing. It, it views the thing over here as its other, but this thing over here views that one as its other. And insofar as that's the case, these are actually in a difference, which is a difference of a sort of identity, isn't it? In any case, he says, it's true that the contradiction and the objective essence is distributed among different things. What is he referring to? We've just talked about the uh, difference between the one and the also, and the also almost, almost gets cast out of the thing turning into itself another kind of thing. We might better say that there is two ways of looking at the thing, and these don't always match up to each other. You can't get them to coincide and remain in harmony. 
He says, the difference will, for that reason, attach to the singular separated thing itself. The different things are thus established as each existing on its own account. Each of them is a, you might say, contradiction within itself that manages to perdure nonetheless and oppose itself to our consciousness and to every other thing it is abutted with or is related to. So he says, the conflict between them is reciprocal in, in this way. Each is different, not from itself, but from the other. This is different from this. This is different from this. They're also different from themselves insofar as they have the also. But now we're focusing on this. If we look at it in this way, each of these things is what he calls a simple determinateness, a having, de being determined, um, a being in a certain way. And it's, it's simple because it's a one, it's a unity. It's opposed to another simple determinateness. Each of them is in itself. Each of them has an in itself or exists as an in itself. So he goes on and he says, um, the different things are, are established as existing on their own account. Each is determined as being itself a different thing. It has its essential difference in its own self. But all the while, not as if this difference were in opposition in the thing itself. But why not an opposition in the thing itself? We know that there's an opposition in the thing itself, don't we? Well... Because another opposition comes to the fore as being more important, as drawing our attention, as telling us, hey, perceiving is not just perceiving this thing and its qualities, and, you know, going through the, well, is it a unity, is it an also, but perceiving this as opposed to, as different from, in contrast, you might say, from this. So we not only have difference going on, Insofar as these are in itself, we also have differentiation between these simple determinateness. We have difference and differentiation. Difference is something you might say, we could say is rather just passive for consciousness. Differentiation is where these things say, we are not the same. We are different from, we are not equal to each other. You cannot substitute one of us for the other. Even though, in many respects, you probably can, can't you? You know, two forks in a drawer or something along those lines. So he goes on and he says, As a matter of fact, since differentness is present in it, it's, it's of course necessarily present as an actual difference, manifold, manifoldly constituted. But because that determinateness constitutes the essence of the thing, by which it, 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 it distinguishes itself from other things and is for itself. That's what it means to be is for itself at this time, to have being for itself. It's at this level that the difference matters. This now becomes unessential. It's not going to vanish entirely, it's going to assume some importance, but at this point in the dialectic, this is not where the truth of the thing, of, of perception, of the object lies in. So he says, the thing does have this, this twofold insofar within its unity. These aspects are unequal in value. So the state of opposition does not develop into an actual opposition in the thing itself. So we, we don't actually have, like we saw in the previous paragraph, uh, a separate thing as the also. The also is just sort of dragged back in. You might think of it as, as being sucked in by the gravitational force of the unity, the, the greater force, the greater strength. The also doesn't resist it as well and, and just goes along for the ride. So he says, um, the state of opposition does not develop into an actual opposition in the thing itself, but insofar as the thing through its absolute difference comes into a state of opposition, it's opposed to another thing outside of it. It's not opposed just within itself. It's now being opposed to something that is a different entity, something that opposes it, something that it resists it, something that says, I am not you. So he says, of course, the further manifoldness is necessarily present in the thing too, so that it cannot be left out. 
but it is the unessential aspect of the thing, both of this thing and of this thing. They both have an also, that's as I just said a moment ago, being dragged along for the ride, but which is not going to matter insofar as we're opposing things to each other, at least not at this point. 